That's right. You the cough live out of the shoot on YouTube. And ooh, we're just setting up the mic here. Hey, everybody. Guess what? It's time to record the podcast. And I said I'd go live at 2 30. It's 2 27. So I went live early. What else? Those of you who follow my channel on the tube can see it. I have to also squinch down. So I'm making my chair, my chair shorter. Oh, we'll change the video. Look, that's my bottle of water right here. I hope I don't need that today. Um, now I'm too short. Dang it. Okay, so today I have an episode about fermentation. And I've done a lot of episodes on fermentation, or I feel like we've talked about it a lot. But then I thought, okay, people are at home and they have what they have. How do they ferment stuff? And why do they ferment stuff? And so I kind of put together four projects for home fermentation that I thought would be fun. And I'm really keen to hear what you think about um, your, you know, your ideas for home fermentation. But I also kind of thought of it from the point of view of what if you can't go to the store and get everything for these. So it'll be kind of a fun show. Now I'm going to get this going up here. Uh, la, 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 la. So I can see things. This is, this is you looking at me getting my podcast ready. Um, yeah, so garage band is up and as usual, the audio is working, so we don't have to restart. I always like it when the audio works. I have saved my file, so I don't hate my life later. And hopefully I won't accidentally hit this. This is my um, Bluetooth keyboard that hooks up to my... If I hit that in the middle of um, recording, it turns out it stops the recorder. That's why I had that mistake a couple times ago. But we're going to record today. And I also wanted to mention that tonight at 7 p.m., we're going to have the holler crew on the sofa, just taking live Q&A from you guys, 7 Central. There's been a little confusion on YouTube because as it turns out, I have to adjust for GMT and set it at GMT and then subtract two hours. GMT. Or add, no, add two hours. I don't know. Anyway, I ha it's like not a normal formula. It took me like half the morning to figure that out. Hi, Sue. Hi, Kat. Good to see you. Welcome. Okay, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to launch into the podcast and record. Sometimes if I see a comment and I can fit in a comment back to your comment, I do. I'm going to stay off on a little bit after if you guys are interested and you can just ask me questions. We'll have a quick little question session here. If you're curious about how to get podcasts going or about fermentation, we can have a bit of a discussion. The way you ask questions is type them in the comments. So with that, I'm going to get my rear end moving. Here we go. Welcome everyone to Living Free in Tennessee, where we talk about building the life you want to live on your terms rather than trapping yourself living a life somebody else wishes you'd live. Like, why would you even do that? But we do that. Our whole society is set up to get us living the way we're quote unquote supposed to, which is not necessarily how any of us want to. Some of us want to, but not all of us. Today is Wednesday, March 25th, 2020. This is episode 286 of Living Free in Tennessee. And today is Wednesday. So it's a how to day. Last year, we were doing a bunch of homesteading specific topics on Wednesday. But today, I just decided in the last month or two, we'll do more how to stuff. Sometimes it might be credit related. Sometimes it might be homestead related or homemaking or I don't even know what like I need to learn more about guns as it turns out. So we may have a few gun episodes. Anyway, today, though, I had a request on Monday about what do I do about fermentations if I'm stuck at home and can't buy them at the store? Let's talk about how to ferment. So I came up with fo four home fermentation projects that are perfect for right now. And a lot of them, not all of them can be done if you don't have some of the supplies, like, like any recipe. You cannot make chicken soup without chicken, right? But you can make chicken soup without parsley if parsley is one of the ingredients. The same with fermentations. You can ferment even if you don't have everything in the recipe as long as you have some of the basics covered. So I'll go over four projects I think are fun. Some of them you may have to mail order stuff. One of them in particular, we just mailed ordered stuff here for the hauler. And that's a, a fermentation project we're launching today. Also, guess what today is? It's Holler Hat Wednesday. Where is she? And why is she so far away from her friend? And who's her friend? Mm, you can look on Instagram at Nicole Sauce, or you can go over on Facebook. 
totally just paused the recording. So when I record this, I haven't posted that yet. So if you're like madly running over there right now, I haven't even taken the picture yet. I know exactly which picture we're taking. Um, and I have a cohort who's helping me do it. Haven't taken it. We'll do it right after I record this. Okay, I'm going to jump back in. Also tonight at seven central central daylight savings time, because they have made us give up that hour again, like they do every year central time. Yes. Yeah, 7 PM. We're doing a live stream on YouTube with the holler homestead neighbors. We will either have three or four of us here that you can ask anything on YouTube. The way you do that is you go to the link to my YouTube channel in the show notes. You'll even see like an announcement that says this is happening at this time. I'll go live at seven. We expect to go from seven to seven thirty, but if it's lively, we'll talk longer. We don't mind. We're having a kind. Of, it's like prepper paradise right now in the holler because we don't. <laughs> it's almost like this has given us an excuse to not have to leave the holler, and it's interesting to see how all the stuff that we've built into our lives to be able to methodically work through our supplies and have things stored up in case there's an issue. It's been interesting to see how all of that works, where our weak spots are, where our strong spots are. And so you can ask us anything about that or really anything else. We'll be there on the sofa. We'll be with a, not with this really nice mic that I'm using right now, but with a room mic off of my laptop computer. Also, tomorrow is Thursday from 7.30 to 8 a.m. on MeWe, MeWe.com. We will have our group live chat. If you have not signed up for MeWe yet, just go over to MeWe.com and set up an account. Look for Living Free in Tennessee and fill out the couple of questions there. And we usually let you in. The deal is, if you don't know the answer to one of the questions, it's okay. Do your best. Do your best. We're looking for sincerity. We're, we're basically using that as a way to screen um, porn bots because the group is not porn appropriate. So we like to know that you're a real person and not going to cause us all sorts of trouble. Finally, if you want to email a stump the sauce or send me feedback or questions, you can do it. Nicole at living free in Tennessee.com. That's N I C O L E at living free in Tennessee.com or head to our website, which incidentally is also living free in Tennessee.com. Click on contact and it will have you fill out a little form and then once you've done that, the email goes to me. I usually see it. Okay. First up, we have what's up in the garden. There should be way more up in the garden than there is. I have to confess that like the last two to three weeks with all of the societal things and questions coming in and people asking for ideas on how to make money. I've, I've talked to several customers about ways to adjust how they how they think about earning money now that they can't have storefronts. Um, I haven't put as much time into the garden as I wanted to. So like even today, before I even sat down to do my podcast notes, it was one o'clock. I had spent two hours on the phone with Lowe's trying to order things that we want to have here for building out the hydroponic system. And I needed to go on a walk to clear my head, came back, was like, okay, it's podcast time. Now nah, I'm spending 10 minutes and I'm going to put dahlias in the ground because I've had dahlia bulbs for like three weeks that haven't gone in the ground. So I did. And it took 10 minutes, you know, back to the point of how long do things take. So I'm getting some visual things in the garden this year. I've got a nice flower garden in front of my house that needs weeding already. And I have some a rose that I cloned from a neighbor's rose last year that I transplanted from my aquaponic system into the actual ground. And then I got to put some spring flower bulbs in and I'm really excited to just have some flowers in my life. I haven't really had flowers since I moved out here except for wildflowers because I was much more focused on growing food. That said, with spring comes weeds and we have tons of weeds, lots of dead nettle, which is considered a weed, although it's also edible. We talked about that on Monday. And so I'm weeding that out, saving the greens I want to save and throwing away or composting the ones I don't actually throw them in the garbage, but composting the stuff I don't want and getting really the hillside and the gardens ready to plant. And then it is time for a round of in-ground planting. So things I want to put out but can't quite yet are tomatoes and peppers and sweet potatoes. I've got sweet potato slips now, thanks to uh, growing some on my own. And Jenny dropped off some as well. We'll, we'll cover that on YouTube one of these nights this week, how to grow food. And then I'm going to be putting in carrot seeds and some other just things that can go in the ground now that are meant to go in the ground. 
Also, my bee balm is starting to grow. I'm very excited about that. That means my lemon balm is not far behind. Lemon balm and bee balm are great tea additives. And lemon balm, if you like rub it on your skin, can help, well, tell mosquitoes you're not interested in being a snack. It, it's not 100%. It's not like DEET, but it is a good deterrent. And I do like that. We have supplies for the outdoor hydroponic system arriving Friday. And I'm pretty sure what's going to happen is we're going to build this thing. And we're going to get into it. We're going to make all sorts of video. And then there are going to be parts missing and there's going to be a round two. So we'll start filming that and probably doing regular updates as we install that on the front of my house. The purpose of that is to grow food in a part of my property that gets brutal southern facing sun, which is also a good thing if you have plants that like light. And I'm doing a closed hydroponic system for my tomatoes to see if we can eke them through the blight a little bit longer because even in my aquaponic system, which has soil, they get late blight. And I really like tomatoes. So I'm hoping this will work out. We're doing two kinds of hydroponics. We're doing one where we run, we plant them and run water through a, a PVC pipe. And then we're doing more of a deep water approach with some buckets where we still circulate the water, but there's more of a deep water place for the tomato roots. And we'll see which one grows tomatoes better. It'll be an interesting learning experience. Finally, we have greens galore. When I, when I get ready to cook dinner tonight, which we are also going to be making video about cooking with Nicole, cooking with what you have, I get to go to my aquaponics system because I've harvested the indoor stuff. And I'm probably going to have two bags, I think, of two gallon bags of lettuce coming off of that thing. So a lot of what we've transitioned to at this point is what's coming off the garden. And I'm really thinking carefully about how to cycle things through right now so that we continue to have fresh vegetables, which I just like to eat. And I, I swear, this is my favorite time of year because in the garden, it's all hope. It's springtime. You have all these awesome plans of what you're going to grow and you get the seeds and you put them in the ground. You talk to me in mid July and I'm like, it's the battle of the garden. <coughs> Never do that to your voice while you're talking. My Lord. That was like, okay, so I'm a voice teacher too and a classical singer. <clears throat> what I just did there was a bad, bad, oh, <coughs> now you guys know what you don't hear on the podcast. Okay. I said, it's the battle of the garden. Now I got to get back into this. What am I going to say next? I was explaining how, yeah. Okay. And here we go. And you just feel like you're running in there trying to keep the weeds from growing. This is something I never faced in Oregon. In Oregon, <clears throat> I got weeds, but I did not get the kind of over my head in two weeks if I go out of town weeds that we get in Tennessee, especially if you go out of town, it just rains. This is what happens. I'm going to go on a trip in July. Everything's under control. I go on, have a house sitter, water the garden if we need to. You know, usually we don't. Rains like a mofo. It rains like a mofo. And then I come back and the weeds are taller than I am. I can't even find my plants. Like that's the thing. I just stopped traveling in July. If I can even, you know, unless I'm getting paid a lot of money. I don't even travel in July because I know that's what's going to happen. Anyway, so right now is the hopeful time. By July, I've decided which plants are going to die. And I swear a different plant every year is the one that doesn't do well. And I also know which ones have been overproducing. Like some years are cucumber years. Some years are tomato years. Some years are chard years. It just all depends. Sometimes I get tons of green beans. Whatever it is, I can it. And I try to can more than a year's worth because if the next year, if like I have a cucumber year this year, probably next year I'm going to have a green bean year and not such a good cucumber year. If I have pickles still, they last two years in the jar. I'm good to go. And then I can the crap out of green beans and then that lasts for two years. So that cycle for me has worked pretty darn well. I'm actually low on canned corn right now. That's the only thing that I haven't quite been able to catch up with. That probably means this is a corn year, though. So maybe we'll have another episode of Corn Cornmageddon, where I have more corn than we can feed people in two years. It took me three or four years to get through it last time it happened. So that's what's up in the garden right now. And I am just really thankful. I have been learning how to grow food for the last 14 or 15 years because um, I got friends starting right now. I'm trying to advise them through it, but they have a certain level of panic that's not helpful because when you come at gardening from a 
a standpoint of pressure, you're a little less casual about what you do in the garden. And I think sometimes being kind of laid back helps you have that time to observe and see what the core problems are and fix them the next year. Because the thing about gardening, it's a, it's an iterative process. You learn things as you go. And oftentimes when you learn something, it's not until a year later that you're putting it into practice. Okay, guys, with that, it's time for the main topic of today's show for fermentation projects. First of all, why would you even want to ferment? And the reason this came up is a friend of mine has been, she's been doing like homemade yogurt and some other stuff for her kids. And she said, you know, I think a lot of people like to eat yogurt and other fermented foods. Why don't you talk about that now when they can't just go to the store and buy a thing? How do you do fermentation? Well, how is important, but why is also important? So there have been some recent studies out that talk about how your health of your gut bacteria impact your health and impact your mood. So they're finding some progress with healthy gut impacting positively people who are depressed, making them less depressed. Happy stomach, happy spirit. Interesting, huh? Also, health issues that come up, especially in the immune system deficiency area, appear to be positively impacted when you have healthy gut bacteria. Um, something I've personally noticed is that my gut bacteria health changes based on where I am ge geographically. And I know this sounds weird, but when I'm in Germany, my gut's a lot healthier for whatever reason, naturally based on the foods I'm eating, and I lose weight. And here, if I continue adding fermented foods, which is adding gut bacteria, I have a better time you know, having a more stable weight. And if I stop doing it, I notice that I feel like I'm not eating anymore, but I kind of, it's like I'm retaining water or something. I don't know. But so we don't really know the full impact that healthy gut bacteria have, but we do know that over hundreds of years, humans have been eating fermented foods whether it was, you know, overly ripe things they found in the woods, that would be thousands of years, or things that they purposefully ferment. Examples of things you might have that are fermented foods are sauerkraut, um, cheese, coffee, <laughs> some teas. Uh, gosh, you know, they like corned beef and stuff like that is fermented. There are a lot of different things, beer, right? Wine. Lots of things are fermented and it's because it's partially a ferment, uh, a preservation technique that it would have been increasingly built into our diets just naturally. Like if you have too much cabbage, how do you store it? Well, you store it in cold storage in your root cellar, but you also can make a ton of sauerkraut and it will just last and last. And I've got a jar of sauerkraut in my fridge right now that's six months old. No problem. No problem at all. You keep it cold. It's under the water and it does not go bad. So there are just like, in addition to flavor and variety and ways of preserving food, it's also got health benefits that research has supported. And I think it has health benefits that we haven't even touched yet, like improving our ability to just eat, like it pre-digests the food for you when it's fermented, right? So I think it's important if you don't like ferments because you haven't gotten used to them to start like teaching yourself to like the flavor. Because one of the things about flavors is we don't really know if we don't like something the first time we taste it, right? I mean, you think you know, but you find if you taste it repeated times, you may end up liking it over time. That's how I was with coffee. My first coffee was disgusting. My first beer was disgusting. Now I like both beer and coffee. Hi, Homestead Glamour Girl. Okay, I had to pause the pod podcast to say hi to you on that. And <clears throat> I needed to think about how I'm shifting gears from why ferment to how to ferment. So really, if you think about it, the fermentation in our lives over hundreds of years has been cut out with the growth of the industrial food system and the reduction of depending on fermentation, which acidifies the environment for using white vinegar, basically. 
and other preservatives. Now we don't need to. So even things that used to be fermented, like pickles, are now made with vinegar often in the commercial food system. So we've just cut that whole section out of our life. Fermentation is a great project to do at home. If you have kids, there, you know, there's science behind it. They can be learning A, how to preserve food, B, why you even want to do it, and C, how the pHs change as part of this process and how that impacts your food and all about the live lactobacillus, whatever um, bacteria and what that's doing and why that's good. There's a lot of learning that can be done there. You learn how to measure. You learn how to weigh things properly. You learn, you know, you have to chart when you've had it. If you know, I don't do that anymore because I do it by gut. But when I first did, I'd write down like when I started it and have a check-in schedule. There's all sorts of skills that you can build into these kind of projects if you have kids. And if you're at home going, gosh, I wish I had sour cream and I don't and I don't want to go to the store. Guess what? You can make it. So that's the first project I would suggest. Now, right now, you may not have everything for this, but it's pretty easy to have everything for this. The first time I ever made sour cream, I took a container of half and half. It was a half gallon because I was serious about my half and half at that time. And I heated it up to 145 and held it there for about 10 minutes. And the key thing about my half and half is it was not ultra pasteurized. It was just pasteurized mixed results with ultra pasteurized pasteurization is raising the milk to like 180 degrees and holding it there for 60 seconds i believe is the time and the temperature or if it's a lower temperature you hold it there for longer ultra pasteurized is like double or triple that i don't even know how hot they go but it's only there for like a second ultra pasteurized milk is, those are the ones you find that last for months like you'll see it in the store and it's april and it says it expires sometime in may or june that's ultra pasteurized. Most organic store commercially produced milk products are ultra pasteurized. Not good for this. Not good for culturing. Okay. So you have a pasteurized milk product and you have a container of sour cream. You, heal, you heat the milk product up to, to 145. Hold it there for 10 minutes. Let it cool down to between 75 and 80 degrees. Put your sour cream in there, which is a live culture. Stir it or put it in the mason jar and shake it. And then you put it on your counter and you want to keep it above 70 degrees if possible. If you're in a cold house, find a warm spot in your house, like on top of the water heater is a really good spot. Don't crake down that jar lid, like put the jar lid on loosely so that if air needs to escape, it can. Or you can put um, like a towel over the top and just screw the lid on with that. And then you let it sit overnight to 48 hours and you check it. And what will happen is it will go from liquid milk to solid milk and it will become sour cream. Can this fail? Absolutely. Sometimes I've had it happen once or twice that it did not fully solidify. The higher fat content in the milk I use, the more consistently I have it solidify. And if it doesn't, it's almost like a liquid yogurty sour creamy. Like you can still use it for flavor. It's just not as solidified. And so, you know, you just rename it for your family some other fancy word for sour cream like sour cream juice Ooh, that sounds terrible anyway come up with a happy name for it and then you know you serve it to them that way and if, if what they like is taco night with sour cream on their tacos or whatever you've got it homemade if you have the basic inputs now you can also use a butter yeah cream fresh sue great creme fresca Whatever, make a. I used to call taco salad and uh, um, enchilada and salada just so it wasn't called taco salad so that it would be eaten in my house. So, anyway, you can also use a buttermilk starter. Same thing, you heat the, the milk to 145 or the cream or the half and half, let, let it cool between 75 and 80 degrees. It's a powdered packet, stir, 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 stir. And then you wait anywhere from 12 to 48 hours for that. Those buttermilk starters are available online. Amazon was looking a little slim, but if you type cheese making supplies into Google, you will get a website of, I think it's cheesemaking.com or something. I'll put the link in the show notes, but they have plenty of cheese making supplies. And what that culture, that buttermilk culture does is it adds a specific sour flavor 
when my grandma was young, one way they made sour cream was just by letting it go sour. That means put the cream out and let it go sour. That's going to have mixed results. It depends on what makes it go sour, right? So the better way is to add a buttermilk starter or add some sour cream because then you know you're getting that flavor that you want, which is sort of a lightly sour flavor and not a, a really strong, unfortunate flavor. So that's project number one. That's one kids love. They get to shake the jar. They get to check in on it. If they like sour cream, they get to eat it. It's, I think that's a really fun one. It's, it's almost as good as making butter by shaking the jar. Okay, second idea, lacto-fermented vegetables. When I'm talking about sauerkraut, this is what I mean. But you can ferment more than just cabbage, right? So to make sauerkraut, what I do is for every five pounds, I shred cabbage. For every five pounds of cabbage, I add three to four tablespoons of salt and I mix it up. And then if I think I want other flavors in there like black pepper or rosemary or spicy hot like ghost pepper, I add that all in there and, and I stir it up with my hands and then I pack it into, I use half gallon mason jars now. I used to use a crock, but I found it's a lot easier to keep a consistent flavor in mason jars. And I use, I, I start with a meat tenderizer I have that fits into my jar. And then I use wide mouth, half gallon mason jars. I can fit my fist down in there and I'll use my fist to push it down. And you're pushing juice out of that as you go. Okay. Sometimes what happens when I do this is that the water, because the idea is to push the water out of the cabbage so that it covers the cabbage because you don't want oxygen hitting the cabbage. So the water serves as an oxygen barrier and that becomes a brine, which is salt water, right? So sometimes the water does not to fully cover the cabbage. And when that happens, I don't worry about it. I put it aside for 12 hours or overnight. Usually I'm doing this at night. Put it put aside overnight. Next morning, what's happened is that salt has naturally, through osmosis, I imagine, just pulled the water out. And so then I can punch it down and then I put a weight in there. There are different ways to put a weight in there to hold the cabbage under the surface of the water. I screw a lid on with a fermentation lock drilled into it. And I'll put the link to those in the show notes too. And I just let it go. It takes anywhere from seven days when it's hot to three weeks to get the flavor I want. I taste it every few days or once a week minimum. And when it's as sour as I want it to be, I replace the lid that has the fermentation lock with a normal lid and put it in my refrigerator. And as I said, I've had a jar there since uh, probably September maybe October. I can't remember. It's been there a long time. And I just, every so often I take some of that, I'll make scrambled eggs. I'll reach into the fridge, take some of that out, throw it on my eggs. It's good to do, to go. So that's lacto fermentation. What's happening there is there are natural bacteria on that cabbage. The salt sucks the moisture out, makes the brine that serves as a barrier from the oxygen. And then those little bacteria go crazy. They start transforming the cabbage from a, you know, pH basic thing to acidic. They, they poop out acid basically. It, it changes the flavor and it's quite yummy if you like sauerkraut. Now you can do this with almost any vegetable. I haven't actually heard of a vegetable you can't do it with. I've just heard that some vegetables end up a little too squishy and have a weird mouthfeel. So if you want to make pickles this way, instead of squeezing the liquid out of the cucumber, you make a brine. And I use a very light salt brine. I use six tablespoons of salt to one gallon of water. Heat the water, put the salt in, make sure it's fully dis fully um, dissolved, and then let it cool. Other people use a 2% brine, which is more salt. I think it's a cup per gallon. I could be wrong on that ratio, but it's a lot more salt than I use. And that's because I'm more interested in the fermentation flavor than the salt flavor. And the salt is there to keep too many, to keep the bad bacteria from growing because you don't want the bad bacteria to grow. So the way you do this is you take whatever vegetables you like. And one of my favorite mixes is jalapeno pepper, cauliflower, carrots, all mixed up together, and onions, all mixed up together in a jar. And then I pour brine over that. Again, you weight it down in the mason jar. It's a half gallon mason jar. Put the lid on, fermentation lock. 
and put it aside again. It takes about the same amount of time as sauerkraut to ferment and it becomes like a pickled flavor. That's what's happening here. That is like a fermented jardinier, which is a, a great topping for sandwiches. You can make a ham sandwich, put a layer of that. The one I make is pretty spicy. If you don't like spicy, instead of the jalapeno peppers, use green peppers, use sweet peppers. It's fine. It'll taste good that way as well. But fermented jardinier tastes so much better than the quick pickle method of using vinegar. So those are two recipes. Now let's talk about what happens if you don't have something. What you really need to ferment is something to ferment, a vegetable. You know, lettuce wouldn't do so well. It's not going to hold up. It's going to become squishy. But, you know, cucumbers, beets, broccoli, cauliflower, peppers, garlic, onions, carrots, any of these things you can ferment. If you have Brussels sprouts and not cabbage, guess what? That's sauerkraut right? They taste the same. It's going to be the same. It's going to be a little bit different of a mouthfeel because um, Brussels sprouts are not quite as tough, tough as cabbage, but it's going to work. And you need salt. And you need something to put it in. And you want a way to control for bugs getting in and yucky bacteria from getting in. If you have a fermentation lock, great. If you don't, you know what you do. It's okay. What you need to be really careful of is making sure that your vegetable stays below the brine level. If you're doing sauerkraut, what you might do is fill that jar three quarters full of the packed sauerkraut, top it with that brine, that six tablespoons of water to one gallon, six tablespoons of salt to one gallon of water, and then make sure that's staying weighted below it. The oxygen's not touching it as long as all of your vegetables are below the surface. And then you can cover the top with some saran wrap, which allows bubbles to come out, but it's harder for fruit flies to get in. Or you can even just do what I did on my, I'm, I'm capturing wild yeast and I have taken flour and sugar and water and put it in a mason jar. And then I put a paper towel and I screwed the lid. Or you can screw the lid on so it's not tight enough and it can bubble out, right? There are lots of different ways you can do it. If you don't have a mason jar, use something else. You can use your crock pot if you're not cooking in it. And same thing, you just need a way to weight that stuff below the water. Ways to weight stuff below the water. In a mason jar, a wide, mason, wide mouth mason jar, a small jelly jar will fit in there. And so you can put that on, screw the lid on, and you have it so that the bottom is down and the top is up, no lid on it. It'll push everything down. It's the perfect size for a weight. You can take a Ziploc baggie and put water in it. Let's see. Kat Baker says, Mama used to use a weighted plate to push the kraut down and throw a dish towel over it to keep the bugs out. That is exactly what I do in a crock, cat. So in a crock, I'll take a dinner plate and I will have Ziploc bags with bricks in them. Like literally, I went out and I got bricks in my yard. I put Ziplocs around them because I kind of felt weird about sterility and it holds that plate down. Works great. With any fermentation, though, you want to check on it regularly because sometimes what happens is a white scum um, will appear on the top. You can just scrape that off and it's fine. If you get black mold, it's ruined. So I like to keep an eye on it. When it's got the flavor I want immediately, I get it into the fridge. I really think lacto-fermentation is a very underutilized thing in our culture that we need to bring back because you can like throw that on the top of a salad. You know, you make a salad and you throw some fermented stuff on there. It adds a really nice flavor and it's really good for our guts. So that's the second project. Third project. Boom, 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 boom. Kombucha. Yeah, kombucha. Do you like kombucha? Do you even know what it is? It's a fermented tea that provides tons of gut bacteria. I really like how it tastes. I'm on keto right now and it's a little higher carb than I want, but sometimes I still throw some in there anyway because you need to have a healthy gut when you're on keto too, right? So kombucha is just a fermented tea and the way you get started with it is somebody gives you a mother and anybody you know who's making kombucha has the mother for you. Their problem is they have too much mother and that's just like a disc of bacteria and it's called a SCOBY and then they'll give you a little bit of their existing kombucha. You can take that Mix sugar with tea. You heat the water up, mix sugar in, add tea bags, let it cool back down. You mix all of those things together, the mother, the little bit of somebody else's kombucha they've already made, and your sugar water tea stuff. And you, you just, same thing as with any other ferment I'm talking about, you cover it, 
make sure that oxygen or the, the air is, that's actually probably CO2 gets out and nothing is getting back in and you let it go through a primary fermentation. Here, what happens is that takes three days in the summer and five days in the winter based on the temperature in my house. And then once that's done, you can drink it. You'll taste it. And you taste it every couple of days. When it goes too far, it's going to taste too vinegary. At that point, it's still good for you. It's just if you don't like how it tastes, you're not going to drink it, right? If you get it too vinegary, it makes a great addition for, for like substitution for vinegar for homemade salad dressing, by the way. Now, if you like it fizzy, you take that after it's gone through its first fermentation, bottle it, add a little bit of sugar, cap it, and it holds that CO2 in, causes it to carbonate. Did I go too fast? I don't know if I went too fast. That's kombucha. Now let's talk about kombucha. If you do not have a friend making kombucha who does not have a SCOBY and does not have a starter, the easiest way to get started, you don't have to have a SCOBY, by the way, you can make a SCOBY is you make that one cup of sugar to one gallon of water, eight tea bags, sugar tea, sugar water tea. This is feeding the bacteria. If you happen to have a bottle of store-bought kombucha, when that cools down, you pour that in. And what will happen is over time, a mother will develop. You'll end up having the solid disc on the top. Sometimes it looks like mold is starting to come. Usually that's not the case. It could be but usually that's the mother starting. So that's the easiest way to make a kombucha uh, a mother, uh, a SCOBY. Okay, well, what if you don't have that and you don't have the, the person who can give you starter? Okay, it's a little harder now. But if you have red wine vinegar, preferably an organic variety that's not dead, hasn't been pasteurized, and you have a bottle of red wine, I have never tried this. I'm telling you what I just learned online. So it could be wrong, but I'm totally going to try it now. Apparently, you can start with red wine vinegar, pour it into a bottle of wine and just let it go. And a SCOBY will develop over time. And then you bring that into, you turn that into your starter and you start making your kombucha. I don't know if that works, but I can tell you one thing I do know. Apple cider vinegar develops a SCOBY and I have used a SCOBY from apple cider vinegar having added nothing. It was just really old and it will totally do kombucha. So I suspect that the red wine vinegar plus the red wine, which is giving sugar to the bacteria would work. I will give it a try. This is just, I think a fun project at home. Now, if you don't have like beer bottles and a capper to put things in a bottle and cap it, if you have two liter soda bottles or smaller, like, you know, whatever soda, not water that are used to having carbonation under pressure. You can pour the kombucha into those and just tighten those lids by hand and leave them at room temperature for a few days and test it. And eventually it will be carbonated if you've added sugar after primary fermentation. So you do the primary fermentation that usually takes me three to five days. Then you add sugar and pour it into bottles, hold that under pressure. So the CO2 stays suspended in the liquid and you get effervesc effervescence. That's also a danger. If you, if you do that and you store it at room temperature and don't ever put it in your fridge to slow that down and you put too much sugar in, guess what happens? A really, really fantastically messy explosion. One of our favorite people, Dory from 40 Acres in a Cave, was out of town, called her mom and said, oops, I forgot to burp my kombucha. So she had some that was sort of carbonating at room temperature and she, every couple of days, would just sort of open the lid and it goes, Shh, and it lets out some of the pressure. Hadn't done that and left and then asked her mom to do it and her mom opened the lid and the contents of the kombucha proceeded to shoot out the top of the bottle like a giant fountain getting her completely covered in kombucha, getting the ceiling completely covered in kombucha. It sounded like a really fun time. And she posted something about it on Facebook, like, good thing I love my daughter because this just happened. Okay, if you're going to burp your kombucha and you've left it out too long, you know, maybe do it outside. But you, you know how when you accidentally shake up a soda bottle, how you open it like super carefully? That's how you burp the kombucha if it's gone too long. How much fun is this for a kid? Like they get to make a huge mess. Who doesn't like to make a huge mess? Okay, project number four, beer. This one is near and dear to my heart right now because I'm not going to the store to buy beer. I'm actually not drinking beer either, but people who come here drink beer. And so 
beer is another home fermentation project. It might be more fun for the adults than the kids, but it is so, it is dead easy to do. And the super easiest way to do it is to go to Amazon or walmart.com, type in beer brewing kit, and it will come up with something that is, you know, $200 or less that includes enough ingredients for one batch of beer. It includes something to ferment it into. It usually includes like a racking cane, bottle caps. It, they all have different things, but it has a basic set of supplies you need to brew beer. And it has your first batch of beer ready to go. You order that, you follow the instructions, you're done. Here's here's what happens though. You, you'll end up getting something to brew it in and you'll have some sort of a liquid malt, which you can make from scratch, but why do that right now, right? You know, if you want beer in three weeks, you, you wanna, or three to five weeks, you wanna just start with a liquid malt. You're gonna probably add hops that are dried at some point at some sort, and you're gonna have yeast. So. To get started, you sterilize all your equipment, you add water to the malt, and there's a ratio that will be in your kit for that. Heat it up, and what you're doing is, what I do is I, I stir it and heat it up to boiling, and I hold it there for about 15 minutes. This is how I do it. And then I pitch the, um, the hops in there. I usually do half of them, let them heat for a little while. I'm straining off. If there's any white foam on top, I'm straining that off because that's like, inconsistencies or whatever. You just get those off. And then at the end, when I'm ready to turn off the burner, I add another round of my hops. So those ones at the end are have, have a sharper flavor. And then you let it cool down to 80 degrees and you pour it into a sterilized carbon, uh, um, fermenting vessel. Different things you can use. A food grade five gallon plastic bucket with a lid and a hole drilled in it with a fermentation lock works great. A lot of people in their beer kits have that and it has a spout out the side for later so that when you rack the beer, you can just take it out of the spout. It's a, it's like a couple inches up on the side so that all the leaves stay at the bottom and then the beer comes out into you know bottles or into a secondary fermentation vessel. I use glass carboys. So I will put it in a glass carboy with a cork in the top. And then in both cases, I have a fermentation lock. And this is just allowing that CO2 to come out and nothing else nasty to come in. When it's in, when it's 80 degrees and in the vessel, I pitch the yeast. So I throw the yeast in, yeast in and then I stir it up in there. You do not want to throw the yeast in there when it's 145 degrees or 180 degrees. It will kill the yeast. But, at, you know, anywhere, anywhere really below 90 usually is fine. But that will uh, allow the yeast to start eating the sugars and pooping out alcohol and CO2. That's what's happening there. Primary fermentation is the first step of fermentation, the first phase of fermentation. You know you're successful when you look over at your fermentation lock and you see bubbles coming out rather quickly. Now, here's what can go wrong. Beer is fizzy, right? You know how it gets ahead on the beer? And if it's going through prime and primary fermentation too fast and you're too full in your fermentation vessel, sometimes that foam starts shooting out and makes a horrible mess. So if you're doing this for the first time, consider putting something like cardboard or, you know, having it on a linoleum floor, something so that if it gets messy, you can clean it up. It's not a big deal if that happens. It's okay. You just pull the fermentation lock out, rinse it off, get it set up again with water as the barrier between what's going on in the ferment fermenter and what's outside, and you're good to go. Secondary fermentation is, so it ferments really fast for like three to five days, and then it slows down, and then it's time for secondary fermentation, which is just the slower fermentation. At this point, if you look at your beer, what you'll see is that it's slowed down, and there's a bunch of scum at the bottom. Those are dead yeast bodies, also known as the, the, the lees. There's still live yeast in there, but there's some carcasses on the bottom. If you leave the beer with those in the bottom, it will impact the flavor. Will it make it terrible? Usually not, but it adds kind of a, a woody, bittery flavor. And so what you do is you rack the beer from one fermentation vessel to another fermentation vessel. And you do this, uh, the, you know, there are two ways to do it. There's a racking cane where you siphon it out, leaving the bottom two to three inches of leaves and liquid in there. Or as I said, if you have a bucket with a spout that's two to three inches up, you very carefully lift it up high, let it settle because all that stuff will get up in the 
in the liquid of the beer. Um, so you let it settle to the bottom again, and then you just pour it out into your next fermentation vessel. Let it go until it's done fermenting. The way I decide this is when when there's no bubbles coming. Like if I look and for 15 minutes or 20 minutes, there's not a bubble, I decide we're done. Okay. Yeast is still in there. It's just gotten to the point where it's out of sugar to eat, basically. So then what you do to carbonate it is you take that and then I rack it again because there's more leaves. And then I add sugar to that. Do I remember how much sugar? No. Let me pause this and check. Darn it. I forgot how much sugar I add. I hate it when that happens. Do, do, do. If anybody knows on YouTube, just, you know, tell me in the, it's like a cup, two cups, something like that to five gallons, by the way, because these are always five gallon batches. Priming sugar to beer, five gallons. I'm literally doing this starting at the end of the week. Uh... Hold on. You know, nobody answers this real quickly for me, do they? Do, 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 do. Anybody else have better Google food than me? You know, some people actually put a spoonful into each, um, a teaspoon into each bottle individually and then pour the beer in. And I think that's insane because if you just put the right amount of sugar into the full five gallons, you're way, way happier. Beer priming sugar. I hate it when I do this and I haven't thought about that in advance because I just know that. Two thirds cup. Okay, two thirds cup of sugar. That's the answer. Thank you, Google. We're going to start recording again. Okay, according to the Google Foo, it's two thirds cup of sugar. Double check that because um, I actually couldn't remember the number. And so I looked online and that seems reasonable. So you take two thirds of a cup of cane sugar. And if you use a different kind of sugar, it's a different ratio. You heat it in a couple of cups of water, to let it cool down. Then you pour it into that five gallons that you've already racked from your secondary fermentation. And you stir it up real well, and then you pour that into bottles, put the caps on the bottles, let that sit for 14 days at room temperature, not 90 degree room temperature, like, you know, 70 to 76 degrees or so, whatever your room is, or if it's cooler, it's cooler. And what'll happen is that yeast reactivates, and it eats the sugar, and it carbonates. Now, if you put too much sugar in, do you know what happens? Kaboom, glass shards everywhere, not good. So be real careful with the sugar, double check that number and check your bottles. Once they've gone through that last carbonation phase, you open a bottle and taste it. What I've noticed is for about six weeks out in your fridge, that cools it down and keeps the yeast from being as active. So that's how to make beer. Now, if you don't have all that stuff, what can you do? You need malt, you need some of that liquid malt, you need hops and you need yeast. So those are the three things you need to make beer, right? Um, and all of that other equipment I just mentioned, meh, I mean, you can use a five gallon bucket, you can use a crock, you can use all sorts of different things. You can bottle it again in those two liter screw top plastic soda bottles. If you want to do this, if you have a keg system, you can just carbonate it with your keg system. A lot of people I know do that. So don't let the lack of exact having the exact stuff stop you. The key is you want to be able to mix those things in a sterile environment, get them to ferment without yucky bacteria come in and messing up the flavor, and then bottle it so it carbonates or have another way to carbonate. So that's uh, like the fourth project is beer. And Sue Laprise, who is watching the live stream, says, our son-in-law made sparkling wine. We drank a bottle every night because they were exploding. <laughs> okay, yeah. It's easy to accidentally make expl uh, sparkling wine because unless you put... Some things that some brewers do is they'll put in a chemical that kills all of the yeast so they don't have the exploding bottle problem. Otherwise, wine just keeps going. It, it goes until the alcohol content is higher 
than the yeast can handle or until it's out of sugar. So I think that sounds like a delightful thing. You know, if you accidentally make a bunch of sparkling wine, just drink it every night before the bottles explode so you can enjoy it. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this show on fermentation. I welcome your ideas for projects that people can do at home or any questions you have about this topic. I always love talking about fermentation. It's something I re never really thought about much when I was younger, but as I learned more about gut health and as I've explored different flavors and almost every culture, actually every culture has something they ferment. Every culture has something they ferment. It's been a really, it's like every culture seems to have a real ravioli style of thing, a stuffed noodle thing that they do. Every culture has a, a fermentation thing they do. Just share them with me, share them online, go to the comments, whatever you want to do. Also, if you want to support the show and the work we do here, you can do it in two ways. One, order your coffee at Holler Roast. Guess what? Hollerroast.com is now doing free shipping over $30. That's right. We changed completely how we do everything there. What this means, if you are an existing customer, you will notice the per pound price of coffee has gone up. It hasn't really gone up. I've just built shipping into the price. And then there's a $4 flat rate for one pound. If you get two pounds of almost any of my kinds of coffee, that puts you over $30 into free shipping, but it's going to cost basically the same as what you were already paying. Shipping went up a little bit in the last three months, so I, I built that in too. So some things are going to be like 25 to 50 cents more. It's not very much, but if that can, if you get confused when you go to the site and see different prices, it's because shipping's built in because new clients are more willing to buy when shipping's included, it's a weird thing. And I figured my existing customers would work with me on this. So anyway, that's one way to support the show. The other way is become a member. Go over to livingfreeintennessee.com, click on membership, and that's how you sign up. With that, guys, go out, make it a great week. Whew, that was a long one. How long did I go? Did I go a really long time? 51 minutes and 50 seconds. This is supposed to be a 30 minute episode. I keep overfilling my content. You guys have any questions or comments while I'm still here? My next step is to add my outro and mix everything and get it uploaded and shared to everybody. And then I get to go um, talk tactical through what he's going to cook. Even now that we don't have all the vegetables from the store anymore, we have to get them off the land. That's going to be a fun one. Thanks, Sue. I had fun too. This one was fun because I choked myself halfway through, which I haven't done the last couple of times. Okay, I'm not seeing questions. So guys, thanks for tuning in. It was glad to have you here. And I'll keep live recording these on YouTube as long as you guys are interested. Um, interview shows, it's harder to do that with, but I believe it's a thought of the walk day Friday. So you get to see me go off on something. I'm not sure what I'm going to think about. I better take a walk and have a thought, right? Talk to you later.